like to convey my heart yes thanks to ITPLE Gujarat sections or Gujarat Sensor Council chapter for organizing this two day workshop especially Dr. Anil Rai for this invitation. And it's my pleasure to share some of our research which we are doing here at Macquarie University, Sydney. So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on the time of the day in your place. I'll be happy to get some questions at the end of the talk. Actually, Anil has presented a very nice overview of the activities of IEEE Sensor Council. So I will not spend much time on that. I am delivering this talk as a part of the Distinguished Lecturer Program of IEEE Sensor Council. And Anil has mentioned that Sensor Council is conglomeration of 26 IEEE societies because of their common interest in the area of sensors and sensing technology. So that's the website. You have seen the picture before in Onin's presentation. In terms of the activities, as Onin mentioned, we have journals. Main journal is the ITBLE Sensor Journal, which was established in 2001. And later on is another journal, which is Sensor Letters. The difference is ITBLE Sensor Journal usually regular paper of eight pages and above, whereas Sensor Letters is relatively short, three to four pages. Also, there are some co-sponsored publications and one of the very good journal is the ITPLE Internet of Things journal with impact factor of nine and above. This shows that how the ITPLE sensor journal is growing with time. Number of article usage is almost reaching 1 million and the ranking is improving with time. So currently our ranking is 16 in the ITPLE publications. In terms of the conferences, our flagship conference is the ITPLE Sensor Conference, which happened every year. Last year it was in Europe. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we did not have it face to face. It was virtual. This year, the conference we are going to have in Sydney, October 31st to November 3. I am the general co-chair of this conference. At this stage, we are hoping that the vaccine for the COVID-19 will be available and Australia will open the border for international travel. We still did not decide whether we have to take the call at this stage, but by April, May, we have to take a call because if we delay, we have to pay a lot of penalty for the venue, which is the International Convention Center in Sydney. So we are hoping that it will be face-to-face. -face. If not, of course, it will be going into the online remote mode via Zoom. So let's see, hope for the best that we can meet in Sydney. So that's the call for papers. If anybody would like to get it, you just search in the internet ITBLE Sensor 2021, and that will take you the website for the conference. The deadline is June 18th for the four page paper. So time is there. Now we are in February first week. So there is some time for doing some research and write a paper for the conference. So I'll be delivering this talk as a part of the Distinguished Lecturer Program. And currently in the ITWA Sensor Council, we have 10 Distinguished Lecturer. Any section or any university, if they would like to organize a Distinguished Lecturer talk, it's very simple. You can see the Distinguished Lecturer's details and contact them with a request talk and everybody will be happy to deliver the talk because now there is no need to travel. Being at home, like I'm delivering this talk from my home is very easy to deliver a talk. Okay, so with that introduction, I'll be now talking about the research. Basically my group, we develop sensors for different applications. Also we make 
systems using sensors. And our ultimate aim is to make the sensors called IoT enabled sensors, Internet of Thing enabled sensors, which means that the data, what we get as a result of measurement using the sensors will be available to cloud. And that makes things very, very important and simple for everyone because you can see the measured data from a remote place. Sensors are very important for our day-to-day -day life. You can say that without sensors, life can actually stop. Human beings are always interested to make their life better. In order to make our lifestyle better or improve, we need to know what is the current situation. That's why the Lord Kelvin says, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. So for the measurement, the sensors are the fundamental element because they actually give you the signal of the quantity you measure. So while you come across the sensing area, you come across different parameters, sensors, transducers, sometimes confusing to each other, but they're very similar. One is that you give, get some signal out of anything. Another transducer is converts energy from one form into another form. You also come across actuators, which does some mechanical actions. Then transmitter for wireless sensor network and internet of things, we need a device which will transmit the signal in the form of electromagnetic radiations. And of course the stimulus, which actually the quantity we measure. In my group, we do both making the sensing systems. When we have a short-term project, for example, master or may final year project, we usually use the readily available sensors in the market and make them systems with smart interfacing, making it attainable. If somebody does PhD, which is a little bit long time, we usually fabricate sensor. So the left-hand side is the readily available sensors and right-hand side is the fabricated sensors in our lab. One of the big picture of our research is providing an environment which is a safe, sound and secure environment for anyone, especially somebody independently like to live in that environment. So we call smart home. The important thing of smart home is that humans are now living much more longer than before. But when they become old at the age of 70 or above, we are not able to do all the activities by ourselves. We need help, but sometimes even young age, if somebody living alone, many unforeseen things can happen. And that's why technology can be very, very useful to help that type of lifestyle. Now here, if you see the, the picture which are talking that in future, another 20, 30, 40, 50 years time, the average lifestyle can go to 120 years. But if you see the right hand side, there are some pictures of Japanese people who are famously known of the highest life expectancy in the world. They still need help for their day-to-day -day activities. They're of course, almost 90 plus years old. But if you see these pictures where a New Zealand man died in his home. He, has, he is only around 40 years old. His dead body was discovered after three weeks. This is very unfortunate, but it happens many part of the world. If you see interesting statistics, almost like 35% people, both in the men and women category, live independently. 
So this is very interesting in terms of the applications of the smart technology to help us in our day-to-day -day life. So what we try to do, we try to use the sensors and wireless communications to make the old home where we live converting into a smart home. With the help of these smart devices, the daily activities, what the person does will be monitored on real time. And those activities will be assessed whether they are regular activities or not. So we have developed in our laboratory, in our university, different types of sensors, which actually measure different activities. Whether the activities is you are opening a refrigerator or you are using your bed or toilet or watching televisions or taking your food, all can be measured on real time. And based on that, we can determine how the person is living. So we have a house. This house was built in 1938. Sensors were installed and then made into a smart home. And then we have person living there. So what it does, most of the time, we do our research in the university environment, but this is not in the university. This is in a house where the house is old. So it's, you can say it's the line kind of living lab. And this is something quite interesting. You can actually monitor the activities for 24 seven. So it ran for a few years and we can also find out what are the problems we face from the sensor, from the communications and other aspect. So we can tell that this is technology assisted home. And here important thing is the sensor which are sending the raw data and data are collected, analyzed. And from the data, we can find out what is the activity the person does. And from the activities, we can tell about the person's life. In general, how well the person is living. So wellness of the person. So lots of computational things are very important because as we know, the sensor gives us data and those data will be analyzed. So computation is very, very important here. So here, what we do, we activate, annotate the activities, different activities, what the person does, depending on the time of the day, we have to annotate the activity. For example, in the morning, if the microwave oven is on, refrigerator is, door is open, the chair is used for the dining, you can actually tell the person is having the breakfast. So that type of annotation is required. Also from that, we can talk about the people's behavior, how the person is behaving. And here we use computational method, probabilistic approach, time series analysis, as well as pattern matching. So these are the computational things we need to carry on on the data which are coming from the census. So here we just say, how, wh how do we decide what type of sensors we actually need? It's a subjective problem. Each persons have different types of lifestyle, even though there are lots of similarity, but still there is a difference. Some people might go to bed early, maybe 9, 30, 10, but some people like to go at 12 or even after midnight. So it should be tailored to satisfy the personal lifestyle. So what type of sensors we need, that will be decided based on the lifestyle. And sometimes you may have a set of sensors which you install, and then you can say the frequency of usage for a particular sensors is very low. So then you can decide that that sensor may not be required for the per that particular person. So once you have the sensors installed, then you can actually check the sensors activity and you annotate the activity. 
you can say the person is sleeping or taking breakfast or dining or gone to toilet or relaxing. Anything can be talked about the behavior of the persons based on the time of the day and based on the activities the person is doing. And then we can talk about the wellness of the persons. That's a quantitative measure how well the person is. So we have defined two types of wellness. The wellness function one, that depends on the inactive usage. So inactive usage means it might happen that the person is not using any kind of sensors. So how long you can wait till you say the person is still safe? So that's the inactive usage, wellness function beta one. Another is called over usage. Over usage means the person is using a particular appliance more than the normal. So for example, you may think of that the bed, which is used for sleeping in the night, you may use eight to nine hours or eight to 10 hours. But if one person for a particular day is using a long time, whether something happened. So that type of wellness functions we define based on the over usage. And then we can actually predict. So based on the few previous data of eight weeks, we can actually forecast what is going to happen for the ninth week. Now, as you can understand that we need the computational technique, which is adaptive and smart, that need to change with time because we need to forecast the person's habit, what it will be for the ninth week based on the previous eight weeks of data and then forecasted data will be used as the base value to compare whether something unforeseen has happened or not. Of course, once the ninth week of data comes, we actually adjust the forecasted data. So that's the way we have to do. And this is the values we can see that forecasted data is actually very close to the actual data what we are getting from the actual experiment. So that trend is very, very useful in many situations that can be used to prevent if something unforeseen is predicted. We also can actually track the persons using the system. So the tracking can happen using the PIR sensors, passive infrared sensors. We can tell where the person is located. So that's very interesting. Sometimes many people, they do research on the fall detections. The fall detection means the person has fallen down. And wearable sensors, of course, very, very useful. But if somebody is not willing to have wearable sensors, this tracking system can be very handy. I will tell a little bit of our few research activities we are, we are conducting at the current time. So our lab, we develop sensors, which are two types. Either it can be MEMS, microelectromechanical systems based on silicon wafer, or also it can be flexible. So the MEMS based system, what we do is basically we implement or we fabricate interdigital type of sensors, which is a capacitive type of sensors based on silicon wafer. And the dimensions varies depending on the applications. It can go the, the spatial resolutions from five micrometer to few millimeter. And we develop one technique called MIP technique, molecular imprinted polymer, which is a polymer which is used for selective detection of a molecule. This comes as a functionalized coating on the top of the sensor surface. And with that polymer, we can detect something of our interest, whether it's a protein, whether it's some kind of other molecule, we can actually do using this. Now this polymer can actually help us to store our system in an harsh environment. You do not need to store in a specific temperature or a specific environment. So that's the very advantage of this polymer. So it's a, it takes almost like 48 hours to produce this polymer. 
Once you produce, it can come as a functionalized coating on the top of the sensor surface. So using that, we have developed sensor for detecting bacteria, E. coli bacteria as the top of the sensor surface. So pathogen detections we have developed. Also we have developed system for detecting contaminations coming out of the plastics in plastic bottle. So that's a very health hazard. And it was having some issue in Taiwan quite some time back. So we developed that detection of phthalate coming out leaching from the plastic bottle. In recent times, we have developed a project, we have finished a project which is detection of early stage of osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is a disease where people lose their bone, the bone gets break down and we have detected called C-terminal telopeptide, which is a type one collagen coming out of the bone. So we have developed a system for detecting early detection of osteoporosis. So some of the result and what we do, the result we can, we upload in the system. So right now this one, what we have done is a point of care device based on the blood of the human. But our plan is to make the system in such a way that we can detect the, detect the problem from urine and the future system can be installed inside the toilet as a smart toilet. So that's the idea. In order to make it happen, we have to de detect few parameters other than C-terminal telopeptide, CTX1. We have to also detect creatinine. So right now, one of my students has developed creatinine sensors, and also we need to detect calcium. So this can come as a sensor array, and then it can be installed in the toilet. Now, one of the problem what we face here is because as we know that urine is not like normal water, the sensor lifestyle is a problem. So unless we have to have some arrangement where the lifestyle can be extended, we will not be able to go for commercial system. In terms of the wearable device, with the advancement of the sensing technology, nanomaterial, smart processing, the size of the devices has become smaller and smaller. And it is possible to develop different types of wearable device which can be owned by human. Now wearable device can come in two categories. One can be which is owned by outside the body. Also it can be implanted. So we are also working on implanted wearable device. There are different applications where the wearable device can be used. Whether it's the monitoring physical or psychological stress, hydration status, cognitive feedback, or even sleep detections, concussion detections. So there are many, many applications where the wearable device is used these days. And the market is steadily growing. This is quite interesting to see, even though many countries, there is a big gap. This gap usually comes from many considerations. One of the main thing is the cost, but with time, the cost of the device will come down. But if the knowledge gap can be bridged, then we can see there will be a huge growth of the market of the wearable device for future. So that's the one of the very positive for the engineers and manufacturing companies to look into that market is growing and future is bright. There are some challenges. Last 10 years, what we see is a huge growth in terms of the performance of the cellular device, Wi-Fi technology, display device, as well as the video processing, but we are a little bit stuck with the battery. Battery is the main power source. And even though there are lots of research are happening for extracting or harvesting energy from different sources, even from the human body for the wearable device, but still the amount is not sufficient for the operations. So battery size has not improved last 10 years is only 2.2 times battery size. That means for the same, if you say ampere hour capacity, the size has gone down only 2.2, 
or with the same size, ampere hour capacity has in, improved 2.2. But other part has done exceedingly well. We are working in this area for many, many years. The first device, almost like 2006, 2007, we used some sensors for monitoring the human conditions as well as the detection of the fall with the help of Zigbee-based system. Zigbee was used as the communications. We have extended it to determine the emotion of the person, where the person is happy, sad, or angry, or normal. Human emotion is a very difficult topic, but we could do to certain extent with accuracy of 85% to determine the simple emotions as we see here. All the data what we measure, we put into cloud. So wearables and cloud IoT goes hand in hand. The basic building blocks, the sensors, embedded processors, internet connectivity. And whenever we talk about IoT, we have to have security in our mind. When the data is available in cloud, anyone can use the data and they can actually do something which we do not like. So security is very important for IoT applications. Interesting survey, it shows that most of the time when you see people are walking, going for exercise, use wearable device, but quite interesting as you can see in this survey, 26% people even wear wearable device while they sleep. That's a very interesting survey for the wearable device, which tells us the market is very bright. There are many headlines, as we know, for recent times with COVID, always we watch that whether we can have a very fast testing system. These days, the testing is take, till takes two to three days. And as we know that we have to be quarantined, and because of this non-availability of the fast testing, the countries are not opening the international border. So there are something happening in this area where the test result can be available within 15 minutes or so. But I'm not talking of that type of testing. It will be possible using wearable device to tell the persons whether the person has got the symptoms. So if you think of the symptoms of, wearable, of the COVID-19, common symptoms that person has fever, tiredness, dry cough, of course, there will be difficulty in breathing. The breath, the breath will be short. There will be pain on the chest or pressure. Even the speech or movement, all, of course, not that much. All these symptoms, along with this most common symptoms, it's possible to have a wearable device developed. A lot of people tried with that to some extent, but ultimately you have to get the test where it comes from the more important parameters from our body. Our lab, we are developing flexible sensor too, along with the MEM sensors. There are some advantages in the area of flexible sensors. One of the most advantage is that you do not need a very high cost infrastructure. So any university with very little infrastructure, the students can actually go for developing flexible sensors. And also fabrication process is not very complicated. So those are the advantage for using the flexible sensors. We work on the interdigital type flexible sensors. And the advantage of this interdigital sensor is that not only you measure the change of resistance, but also you can use the capacitance. The capacitance can change due to the change of the dimensions. So whenever you have got any stress, apply it to a flexible sensors. As you can see, the change of the dimensions that is reflected in the change of the capacitance. So in our lab, we develop different types of flexible sensors using different material, whether it's the PDMS, polydimethylsiloxane, PET, polyethylene tetrathalate, or polyamide film, along with material for the electrodes, carbon nanotubes, graphene, alumina and so on. Depending on the applications, you have to select the material, base material as well as electrode material. We always look forward to see new 
reported material in the papers written done by others because we are not material scientists. So that's a problem. We do not actually do experiment unless we see that some new materials are reported. So last three, four years, we have fabricated different types of sensors in our lab for environmental applications, physiological monitoring, also as a tactile sensors, which can be used in the robotic type of industrial applications. We also use 3D printing for fabricating the sensors in our lab. One of the challenge these days we feel that even though there are lots of reported sensors are available, but lifetime is a big problem. What we are trying here is that how can we extend the lifetime as well as how can we actually design a large electronic skin? If you think of the human skin, it's like almost two meter square area. So whether we can develop large elect electronic skin simulating the human skin. So in order to do that, of course, we can make many sensors distributed, but that will not make the system economic as, as well as efficient. So here we are going for a different approach, which is a matrix approach, which reduces the number of wares as well as the number of measuring point. So that's what at this stage, one of my PhD students is looking into. I'll tell about the last topic of our research, which is implanted sensors used in the human body. That's the plan. So the PhD student is working for that. The whole idea is to assess when a interbody fusion happen in the lower back pain, how the stress happening with time. As you know, many people, including me, suffer from the lower back pain. Almost like these days, more than 50% people above the age of 45, 50 are having this issue. Many people go for operations. This is a costly affair. In the lumbar L4 and L5, in Australian currency, one operation can cost $80,000. But these operations is not always successful. So as we have seen, we see from the picture here, lumbar interbody fusion, LIF, they used different material to hold the L4, L5 junctions and make it immovable. But they do that with the help of different screws. It can be loose, screw can come out. It can be having different fuse problem. It may not fuse properly with the human bone muscle graft. So there are a lot of issues. So doctor wants to see how with time, the stress is distributed along this area of the operations. So our idea is to monitor after the operations, how the interbody cage is carrying the load at different parts, when the bone and the graft is growing, how this change is happening, whether that is happening very nicely or one part is getting more stress than other. So there are a lot of area which we need to investigate. At this stage, we have done some finite element analysis to see the different material, how they actually interact with the bone the cartilage as well as the graft, how the stress is distributed with the material properties. And the whole idea is to use the sensors inside this interbody cage to monitor the actual measurement. There are, so far there is no in vivo experiment has taken place in the world. So that's the idea we have done the finite analysis for the stress strain distribution. And we have, we have some idea what type of material will have what type of stress. And we have done some preliminary experiment. This is not has gone yet inside the body at it will take some time, few years. 
these sensors which you have fabricated, they are very small sensors. The resolution is around 250 micrometer and the size is 2.5 millimeter by 5 millimeter. We'll have seven of these sensors inside the interbody cage. Interbody cage distance around 80 millimeter by 40 millimeter. And as you can see here, the result, we measure both capacitance and resistance. Many people of this type of sensor, they rely on the change of resistance. But if you see the change of resistance, there is not that much, very, very little change at very low frequencies. But whereas the capacitive change is quite significant and that gives quite a re good range of frequency, which is quite important to understand, to develop the sensing, smart sensing system to determine the effect of these changes. Of course, there are lots of challenges on this. One of the biggest challenge is how do we provide the energy to these implanted sensors? So there are a lot of discussions we are doing at this stage, whether we will supply energy from outside so that the sensor will extract that energy and then it will operate kind of RFID type. So those, those type of things are at the discussion stage. We still did not decide what we are going to do. But anyway, one student is working on this for his PhD and the progressing well. So effectively, I'll, I have come to the end of my talk. I'll summarize here. So in our lab, our big picture is to develop different types of sensors which provide the human life better, more comfortable, and provide more wellness. We work both on the wearable domain as well as non-wearable domain. We work both on the MIMS as well as flexible. In recent times, flexible sensors becoming more and more popular. As you have seen that IEEE Sensor Council has started a new conference, FLEPS, flexibles and printed sensors. And lots of lots of papers are now reported. So a lot of people are doing research in this domain. Still, there is a big challenge to design and develop large electronic skin sensors. The problem is the resolution, spatial resolutions, and of course, sensitivity and interfacing electronics. These are the other new challenges. These days, also there are a lot of research going on, making the flexible sensors implanted within inside the human body. With that, I will end here and I'll be happy to take comments and questions from the audience. So thank you very much. Please feel free to put your questions here.